my name is Ben Wittes. I'm a, I'm a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I, I'm joined with uh, uh, two panelists who really need no introduction, uh, uh, so I'm going to keep introductions very brief. Uh, 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 we have uh, one former attorney general, a former uh, federal judge, uh, uh, Michael McKenzie. We have uh, Neil Eggleston, former White House counsel uh, in the Obama administration, uh, currently teaching at Harvard and, and uh, now back practicing law at, at, at Kirkland. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have nothing to talk about because there's, there's nothing going on. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, one of those periods when, you know, there's just, you know, the unitary executive is just kind of a theory that, that has no relevance to day-to-day -day news or anything. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going we're gonna to try to keep uh, as a lot of time for you all to engage and ask questions. Um, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, in sequential order of administration, uh, uh, Judge McKay is going to uh, talk about how the Bush administration thought about these questions. Uh, 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 Neil's going to talk about how the Obama administration thought about these questions. And I'm going to give a few thoughts, uh, not as a representative of the Trump administration, uh, which I'm certainly not, uh, but I'm going to give a few thoughts about uh, I, the unitary executive in the Trump administration, and then we will just uh, devolve into conversation and see where it goes. Uh, so that you all know and are on fair notice, uh, this is being recorded, uh, and I am uh, at least tentatively planning to run the recording of it on the Lawfare podcast uh, this afternoon or this evening. Uh, so um, with that, I will uh, turn it over to, ne uh, to Judge McKay. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I, I like the, the needs no introduction formulation, although I, I will tell you in the privacy of this room that I like them. Uh, I like introductions. So I, I can do one if you want. No, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, the I don't want to insult the intelligence of anybody here, but um, I would start with some basics on the unitary executive and whence it's derived. Um, the theory. Uh, Article 2, Section 1 says the executive power shall be vested. The executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States. It doesn't list a bunch of subjects uh, for the executive power. It doesn't say all except a small piece of the executive power. It says the executive power, all of it. Um, there are some duties that are placed upon the President, uh, some authorities that are given to him specifically, but it's the executive power. Um, the only substantive obligation that I can find that's placed on the president is to take care that the laws shall be faithfully enforced. Um, that's a plateful. Um, contrast that, of course, with Article 1, which says all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, and then it goes on to list specific enumerated powers. Now, there are some people who actually believe that, in spite of that, um, they couldn't have really intended to have an executive that had all the executive powers because, after all, we had just gotten done fighting a revolution against a tyrannical king. Uh, and if any of the rhetoric in the Declaration of Independence is to be taken even half seriously, he was a tyrant. Um, yes, but what immediately preceded the Constitution was the Articles of Confederation, uh, which was a really unpleasant experience um, with no executive or no executive worth anything and um, a lot of meddlesome folks in, in the legislature. So it's, there's every reason to have written the Constitution the way it was written and to have put all of the executive power in the president. Um, but what really are the limits of presidential power? There's not really a whole lot in the way of law on that subject. Um, maybe unsurprisingly, there's the steel seizure case and there are a couple of other cases, but that's pretty much it. Um, for a large, to a large degree, uh, what the president may or may not do um, is contained in memos of the Office of Legal Counsel, um, which the President consults uh, to determine the limits uh, of his power. And generally, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel um, is there to push the envelope um, and to essentially, yes, define the limits, but also to, to show the President how to do what he wants to do. Um, there was a time when um, even disobeying the law was an option. Um, 
Jefferson said that a, 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 he said a, a strict observance um, of the written laws is doubtless one of the high virtues of a good citizen, but it is not the highest. Uh, the laws of necessity, uh, of self-preservation, uh, of saving our country when in danger are of higher obligation. To lose our country by a scrupulous adherence to written law would be to lose the law itself with life, liberty, property, and all those who are enjoying them with us, thus absurdly sacrificed, uh, thus absurdly sacrificing the end to the means. Um, as a disciple of Locke, he could very well have felt that, um, and that didn't raise any eyebrows. Lincoln, of course, uh, raised armies and borrowed money on the credit of the United States, um, powers that are specifically given to Congress. Um, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which um, is in uh, Article One. Um, that is the the, uh, the provision for uh, suspension of the writ is contained in Article One, although it's not specifically given to Congress. Most people agree that it's a congressional prerogative, um, and he. Uh, uh, ignored a, uh, a distinct and specific direction from the Chief Justice of the United States uh, to free a prisoner who was illegally detained. Um, that that order, if you should read it, it's very eloquent. Um, and uh, it comes from the pen of the author of, of uh, the Dred Scott decision, Roger Tawney. Um, Roosevelt um, um, threatened to, to disregard price controls if Congress didn't repeal them. Uh, they did, um, and they folded. Uh, of course, an ex-party Quirin, uh, when three uh, German saboteurs were rounded up, uh, actually six, I think, were rounded up, uh, having landed off Long Island and off Florida, uh, Roosevelt directed specifically that notwithstanding that the courts were open, uh, they'd be tried by a military commission. And he, um, he told the Attorney General at the time Francis Biddle, that if his, one of his marshals showed up with a writ of habeas corpus, the marshals would join the German prisoners in the cell. Uh, I should add that that was a, a very efficiently handled case from the time they landed until the time they were executed. It took three months. Um, but um, all of that said, uh, he, yes, he traded uh, destroyers for bases on his own, um, but when it came to getting authority uh, for Lend-Lease, he went to Congress, um, and others, Lincoln went to Congress and went to the people. And so there's some question about whether, notwithstanding that you have the power, it's sometimes wiser to try to enlist the support of the legislature, even if you don't, strictly speaking, legally need it. Um, there are those who believe that um, the president with whom and under whom I served um, should have enlisted the help of the legislature more in arranging for detainee policy and for interrogation policy than he did. Um, and there were some unhappy results for failure to do that. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true, but that's the wisdom uh, in, in, in some areas. Um, I'm going to stop here um, and let Neil take over. And then at some point, I'm sure we'll get to current events, as we used to call them in the, in the seventh grade. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Mr. Eggleston. The Thank you. Is yours. I'm, thanks. I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I uh, was here speaking to a session, I think, about 18 months or so ago when I was still at the White House. I think I was the first uh, uh, White House counsel of a Democratic administration ever to address the Federal Society. And I was honored to do it, and frankly, I'm honored to be invited back. Uh, is your mic on? Because it might be on, but not close enough to my mouth. I'm actually not hearing you. Okay. On now? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, I just uh, thank everybody for letting me talk, for those of you who missed the first couple sentences. Uh, I've been uh, teaching for the last couple of months at Harvard Law School a seminar in presidential power. Um, I designed the curriculum because Harvard wanted to know what I was going to teach about before they agreed to the class, well before the election. And as you might guess, the election caused uh, radical restructuring of my uh, agenda. The course was on presidential power, and we covered a number of things that have happened in the last 116 days or, or whatever during the course of that. I thought I would spend just a couple minutes talking about the way we thought about the unitary executive and these issues of executive power uh, in the Obama White House. I was there as White House counsel for the last three years, so I was there 
for one year plus an additional two years. In the last two years, of course, we didn't have the House or the Senate, and so we were acting um, in a situation where the likelihood of congressional action was really quite low. Um, as I think we all know, it's sort of a common maxim that executive power waxes and wanes over the course of uh, time. Events like Vietnam and Watergate have a tendency to diminish presidential authority. Uh, typically, statutes come out of those kinds of issues that are attempts to constrain executive power, and issues like 9-11 uh, typically result in a tilt back the other direction towards, uh, towards more uh, exercise of executive power. As now Justice Kagan wrote somewhat famously over two decades ago, though we live in today in an era of presidential administration. We thought at the Obama White House that a complex mix of factors affected the president's ability to pursue his agenda aggressively. The first is we felt quite strongly that we needed the public's trust and the public's confidence, and that without the public's trust and confidence, our ability to pursue an executive actions would be significantly diminished. Uh, we also knew that we were more apt to be sustained if it was an area of perceived uh, need for aggressive executive action, and obviously, as I mentioned, who controlled the other uh, uh, the, the congressional branch was a significant issue as well. You know, we've gotten to a place where I think the press and the media and frankly the public looks for and likes aggressive executive action. Uh, the robust exercise of presidential power is also, I think, a result of other factors that Justice, now Justice Kagan identified. One is the American public has a really extraordinary view about what the president should be doing and the assertiveness of his actions. I mean, generally, and we saw this quite recently, for some reason it's always better to bomb than not to bomb. And uh, I think we ought to think about uh, sort of the accolade someone gets for bombing as opposed to not bombing and thinking through whether what we're really rewarding is some action, whether the action is actually tied to a greater strategy or not. Um, uh, there's also increasing pressure on the president to demonstrate leadership. And finally, I think that the increased polarization of Congress means that really not all that much ends up happening. Uh, in our era, essentially, with a few exceptions, Congress uh, enacted statutes designed to keep the government open for another year. But apart from that, Congress just didn't really do all that much, with some notable exceptions. It passed the USA Freedom Act. I think uh, that was a significant uh, bipartisan effort and a few other issues like that. But generally, in, a, in an era such as we are in, the ability to look to Congress for activity has just been diminished. I mean, the, the president certainly at the beginning of his administration wanted to work with Congress and recognized the importance of working with Congress. And uh, obviously, uh, people will uh, obviously disagree with that assertion. Um, but uh, over time, uh, as frequently happens, as presidents lose houses of Congress, that ability uh, dissipates. Um, so we did work. We did act, particularly, I think, I hope it's just a coincidence, but particularly the three years I was there, we acted uh, pretty aggressively in areas of executive action. Uh, we promulgated rules to cement some of the earlier legislative activities, such as Dodd-Frank and the Affordable Care Act. But in addition to those, we took pretty sweeping action, uh, some of it not all that successful in the courts, but in, in connection with uh, immigration uh, policy. Um, guns and taking actions to uh, in our efforts to confront uh, terrorists, including, frankly, the decision to designate ISIL an associated force of al-Qaeda, which was an issue that was pretty controversial at the time uh, the president did that. We believed, as I said, that robust executive action is really only possible if you maintain public trust and confidence. So let me tell you uh, several aspects of how I think we went about that. Uh, first, we uh, stro strove very mightily, at least in our view, probably not in the view of people in this room, or at least some of you, that we wanted to make sure that we believed there was a solid constitutional or statutory basis for what we were doing. We consulted extensively with the Department of Justice. I would get things that called litigation risk assessments to get a sense of how uh, courts might rule in connection with what we were doing. I will tell you, though, I did not have a rule that if any district judge anywhere in the country might rule against us, that was not a reason not to go forward. Um, uh, we, we, that was, and I suspect that this administration similarly 
has to take the view that the fact that some judge could rule against you is not a reason not to go forward with an executive action if you're confident that in your own mind that it's lawful and, and, uh, and appropriate. Uh, the second is that we had a very rigorous process for considering our actions. And I'll just mention the DAPA, uh, our big executive action. That was very highly vetted with the Department of Justice, attorneys, uh, with the Office of Legal Counsel. I got a lengthy Office of Legal Counsel opinion in connection with that, saying that that activity was lawful. We worked very closely with DHS attorneys, State Department attorneys. Look, you just can't, you, uh, immigration is not an area where amateurs should be allowed to play. And you can't figure that out just by reading the statute. And we made very extensive use of expertise within the agencies in order to come up with that and could, frankly could not and would not have done it and I insisted that we bring them into the process so that we got to uh, a resolution that we thought was lawful as well as effective from a policy point of view. The other thing is we tried to the extent we could to be as transparent as possible. Uh, obviously there are class, uh, classified information issues, there are things that we couldn't particularly talk about but we tried to have speeches and other uh, ways to, to discuss the policy reasons as well as the legal reasons for a lot of the activities that we took. In December of last year, we published, uh, I'm sure hardly anybody in the room knows about it except maybe for Ben, uh, we published a lengthy uh, uh, description of the way we thought about the legal issues with regard to our national security activities. And when I say legal, I don't mean just statutory, but also some of the constraints that President Obama decided to put on the way various of, of his executive power should be uh, uh, implemented, mostly by making sure there were constraints and there was a thoughtful uh, process uh, to go through. And um, finally, uh, we ex respected our co-equal branches of government. Um, we were fairly successful, actually, in our litigation in the Supreme Court, somewhat less so in various district courts. Obviously, we lost APA and lost some other matters, uh, but we were respectful of them and their role. Um, I disagreed uh, strongly about some of the decisions, but I uh, uh, kept my disagreement to the level of the uh, decision that had been rendered, and I thought that respecting them as an institution was critical to the operation of the government. Um, let me, um, obviously we were criticized on a lot of these things. People in this room probably disagreed with much of what we had done, and I'm, I'm uh, fine with that, but I'm comfortable with, uh, completely comfortable with the way we went about exercising that authority. So it's a new administration, and let me just make some observations about um, my sort of recommendation about how they think about this uh, action as well. Um, uh, first, um, obviously a number, a significant part of what this administration has done is reverse actions by the prior uh, administration. We recognize that was a possibility. That's the disadvantage, frankly, of the unitary executive because as uh, Mike said if you don't go to Congress the permanence is significantly less so we knew there were things that we had done that the next administration could undo it but that's part of our that's just part of our democratic process elections have consequences and and we knew that it didn't stop us from doing what we wanted to do but we recognized that that was something that uh, that, that might happen uh, we worked very hard to have progress with Congress on both uh, immigration and criminal justice reform it didn't happen for reasons that lots of people can analyze, but, but we would have much preferred to go that direction on both of those. And we're somewhat limited about what we could do because it was executive action and not more. Up second, uh, as I mentioned, I think it's critically important that this administration hear from people across the government <coughs> who have expertise in these issues. Uh, expertise in these issues does not lie in the White House. It, you cannot design an immigration policy out of the White House. It is too complicated. And I just urge them on all their various issues. There are dedicated career officials across the government who are enormous resources in how to achieve results. Uh, I had a practice of going around to the various, I don't know if my successor has done this, probably not. He seems like he's a little too busy for this. Um, but uh, I had a practice of going around and addressing general counsel's offices in the various different agencies, completely nonpartisan. And what I did is thank them for their work and made it clear to them that I knew that 99% of the work in the government was done by them, not by me. And I may have had the fancy office in the West Wing, but they were the ones who were doing the legal work of the administration and, and any administration, since so much of it is actually not tied to a, a particular uh, policy bent or not. And so I went out of my way to thank all of them for the great work that they did. And the, the only, I guess the third point um, is 
that as advice is given by lawyers in this administration, I think the issue is not simply is it lawful or unlawful. There are a series of norms that have uh, grown up, I think largely grown up, uh, I would say, since uh, Watergate in the Nixon administration uh, because of uh, concern uh, about how the levers of power were used then, and I think it's important that those uh, norms continue uh, to be followed. So the, f the final uh, point, and then I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Ben, um, is that obviously th this issue of uh, executive power, we talk about it, it's you know sort of back and forth, and uh, it, it uh, tends to be one of these issues where if you're conservative, it's a, it's a progressive president, you think it's terrible, but if the reverse happens, you also think it's terrible. So it's, it's kind of one of these issues that I think uh, in some ways follows on your political bat. But, but I, I do think that the issue of trust is a critical issue for any administration to get its uh, job done and to get its policies implemented. And I think you need trust of the American people, you need trust of Congress, and frankly, you need trust of the, of, uh, the judiciary in order to uh, get your job done and to get the policy done. And that, after all, is why uh, the people of the United States elected any particular president to be president. We felt that very strongly. President Obama felt that very strongly. And it was one of his instructions to me. He would say, look, Eggleston, I want to fight about policy. I don't want to fight about all the sideline stuff. Keep, don't let's keep my building from getting involved in the sideline stuff because I want to fight about policy. That's where I want to put my energy. There's a limited amount of energy that you can put into any activity, and I want my fights to be about policy. And that was his direction to me. So anyway, Ben, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so before I talk a little bit about uh, the unitary executive in the Trump administration, I actually have a question that I want to ask both of you uh, in light of your remarks. Uh, so the term unitary executive uh, often is a conflation of two sets of ideas that seem to me quite distinct. One is how vertically integrated is the executive, uh, that is how much authority does the president have to command and appoint uh, within, the, within the structure, whatever the scope of the executive's authorities are. And the second is uh, how uh, robust are the executive powers substantively themselves in, in relation to, particularly to Congress. Uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administrations had quite different uh, approaches to interactions with Congress and to sort of how robust the authorities were. But my question is, on the unitary quality, that is, how unitary you guys regarded the executive branch as, was there really any daylight between the two administrations? Uh, just based on reading headlines and based on the limited experience that I had, I don't think so. Um. So I think, I don't, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, struck, and I think we're obviously seeing it now, I don't mean to get to current events too quickly here, Ben, but I, I do, um, the administration is a very large place, and I think we learned pretty early on that the president only has so much power to direct what happens below him, and um, so he, in some ways he had to convince the uh, administration as, as much as convince the American public uh, in order to get things going uh, forward. So, so I think that's right. I think there may be some areas where we disagree. The, we were supportive. Um, this may be slight, this may be too wonky, but I may probably nothing's too wonky for this audience. But uh, you know, there's this issue about whether uh, Cordray, as head of CFPB, <laughs> is uh, permissible as a single commissioner and Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, in an opinion, which I read recently for my class, I hadn't realized actually he was the only one of the three judges that took that position. I, I just assumed that one of the other judges was with him, but wasn't. Um, our Justice Department uh, sought review of it. Now I think that the uh, uh, Trump Justice Department has actually now come in on the other side of it, or at least maybe has announced it's coming in on the other side of it. So I think there are some issues like that that are percolating. In some ways, I've always thought that those issues have been more important to the conservatives than they were to us. Um, I don't, I, I sort of, it, it, it came out in my era, and so I went around and said, you know, look, I represent the President of the United States here. Should we think about whether we like this opinion or not like this opinion? And 
I, I don't. It did not appear to me that that particular feature had was a was a strong selling point. Uh, but in any event, there are a number of different agencies that have a similar uh, structure, and we decided to uh, support the CFPB on that. But there are some of those kinds of issues I think that are different. But as a general matter, I don't think we're all that different. Okay. Um, so the reason I ask that question is that I actually think that we sometimes use the term unitary executive as a as a, uh, a, a general umbrella term for presidential power, and uh, uh, and I actually think there's a pretty broad consensus across the last several administrations that the executive is in fact pretty unitary, and the reason that strikes me as an important point is that that consensus has clearly broken down at least functionally now in my view and what we're seeing in the Trump administration is and I think this is I, I, I hope no one will take this as a partisan or ideological point uh, just a factually truthful statement as the least unitary executive any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes uh, and I by the way I hope the least unitary executives any of us will ever see again in our lifetime so let me tick through a few data points in support of that, I think, very modest proposition, actually. Uh, so before I do, though, one, one general point. Um, you know, when you read the theory behind the unitary executive, whether it's, you know, Hamilton in Federalist 70 or Justice Scalia in the, uh, in the uh, dissent in Morrison v. Olson, uh, one of the recurrent themes is that unity is necessary for accountability, uh, and that you know you need you need a certain level of unity, and both of them regarded that unity as essentially total, in order for there to be accountability for for responsible decision making, uh, and so just keep that in mind as I tick through the following. Uh, so the first of all, first of all, we have this remarkable sp scene going on in which cabinet and even sub-cabinet officials contradict presidential statements. Uh, this is an unheard of thing in a functioning unitary executive. Um, but uh, the, somebody as low uh, as the ambassador to the United Nations takes it upon herself to, on Sunday talk shows, uh, merely ignore presidential statements. And here's the, here's the thing that really affronts the unitary executive about it. Uh, we all find it relieving, well, a big relief when she does so. Uh, and so we have this, this bizarre scenario. And by the way, this is true across uh, almost every cabinet official uh, is in the position that the president says something or said something during the campaign uh, or continues to say something or tweets something and then a relevant cabinet officer has to say that it doesn't count, right? This is, a, this is not a Hamiltonian vision of the way the executive, I mean, maybe it's a good thing, uh, but it's, a, it's not the unitary executive, I think, as anybody in this room understands it. Um, second thing is leaks. Um, we have never seen uh, a a torrent of leaks out of the executive branch uh, the way we have seen it over the three months of this administration. Now, you can say a lot of things about them. And I'm not here to have a conversation about leaks, though I'm you know, happy to if people want to. Um, but one thing you can't describe it as, as is as the vertically integrated executive functioning as it's supposed to function. Uh, this administration has absolutely zero ability to control information. Uh, if you look at Federalist 70, one of the virtues of the unitary executive, as Hamilton describes it, is its ability to act with, I believe the language, I didn't look it up before I came in, I believe the language is secrecy and dispatch. Um, uh, so we, dispatch is a debatable proposition with respect to this administration, uh, but secrecy is not. It's uh, simply not functioning in that, in that respect. Um, third element of failure, failure of the unitary executive is staffing. Uh, I haven't looked at the latest uh, reports of how much mid-level staff remains unnamed, uh, but it is huge. Uh, and one of the things about having a vertically integrated 
executive branch and with one person at the top is that you need a set of people in the middle to act as the connective tissue so that uh, the direction from the top uh, can actually come down and filter down to the arms and fingers and toes and feet of, of the executive branch. If you think of it as a body, this is a body with no neck. Um, and that's a real, real problem if you're thinking about the functionality of a unitary executive. Uh, then there's process. Uh, so this has gotten a little bit better, I think. Um, but we saw in the very beginning of the administration astonishing failures of process. Now, process, these processes are not legally required. They're things that developed you know, the, the executive branch is not anymore uh, President Lincoln sending telegrams and two secretaries sending telegrams to his generals in the field. You know, Mr. McClellan, if you're not planning to use your army, do you mind if I give it to somebody who will? Right, that's the sort of famous, 19, it's, it's a prototypical, it's a famous story for a lot of reasons, but it's a, it's a very, if you think about it, it's a very 19th century vision of the executive, right? There's no joint chiefs of staff in between. There's no, sec the Secretary of War isn't in between, right? It's just the President kind of firing off what he wants to do. And it's not the way the executive branch works anymore. Um, now, the attempt to function that way at the very beginning of the administration with respect to the executive orders on immigration and, and just didn't work. And it didn't work because we have these processes that have built up in order to manage the vertically integrated executive branch. When you uh, ignore those processes, when you don't avail yourselves of the processes, the branch simply doesn't work. It's it, you know, quite apart from what you think of the policy or whether you think the president has the authority to do the things that he wanted to do. Uh, so what I would say is what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequences are, are legion. In fact, I would say that uh, other than the mercurial personality of the individual of the executive. And remember, Judge McKay's point at the beginning is, is, is actually critical to this. The executive branch is a person. Everybody else is just the arms and fingers and limbs, but the power is vested in a person, right? And I would say that all of these these process issues, these failures of the, of, the, of the functioning of the branch are integrally related to the mercurial nature of the person's, the, the personality that we're dealing with in that office. Uh, and the result is a few things. One is, uh, you know, the complete inability to respond it, and to manage news cycles. Uh, the failure of information control includes the failure to be able to send out White House press officials to talk to the press in a fashion that doesn't then get contradicted uh, minutes or hours or a day later, including by the president. That's also you know, a, a deep failure of, of, the, of the institution of the executive branch. Uh, it has enormous implications in litigation. Uh, when the executive branch isn't pro functioning pro properly, courts do not defer to the executive branch, and you're seeing that in the executive order litigation right now. Uh, and it hugely impairs congressional relations. Uh, there have been uh, no substantial legislative accomplishments uh, through the first 100 days, and there's a reason for that. Uh, so I would say I'm going to take the words take care out of the context of the take care clause here. But you know, one of the traditional things that we expect branches of government to do is to take care to preserve the prerogatives of their branch. And I think one thing that we all have to be very concerned about is that that is not happening right now and that the consequences to the structure of the unitary executive as we understand it uh, and as people like the Federalist Society have been guardians of, of the, this idea over a long period of time is very much at risk. Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop there. And uh, let, me, let me start by asking uh, both of my co-panelists um, you know, 
to what extent they think any of that is overwrought or, or to what extent they disagree with any of it? Well, um, so far as the, just to pick one element of, of what you discussed, um, the failure of process with respect to executive orders, I don't know whether any of you remember um, the second day of the Obama administration when he famously signed the executive order, among other things, closing Guantanamo. Um, it's still on. It's still on YouTube. Um, and there's a moment there where he, he sort of reads it off by the power vested in me, consistent with the with the national security interests of the United States. Blah 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 blah. Signs it with a great flourish. There you go. And then um, he says, "Greg," um, and that's a, apparently a reference to Greg Craig, who was then White House Counsel. Um, do we have another order here saying what we're going to do with these people? <laughs> and a voice off camera says, um, we're, we're going to have procedures. And he looks very earnestly into the camera. He says, we're going to have procedures. Um, this is not unique um, to the current administration. It was fairly obvious that nobody had, well. Um, and then there are other, I mean, there are other failures of the exercise of, of uh, executive prerogative, like, for example, the Iran um, executive agreement, which I would love at some point to discuss. But anyway. So, Ben, I don't, uh, I don't disagree with your analysis. And, I, and I'm actually surprised that I'm surprised by it uh, in a lot of ways. But not your analysis. I'm surprised that, you know, that this has somewhat uh, come to pass. And I'm not sure quite what happened. For some reason, we've gotten, maybe it's because it's such a personality-based administration so far, so everything is hovering around their particular personality. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, Mike uh, talked about the Guantanamo uh, issue. But, you know, it, it may have been a bad idea, but it didn't cause chaos at every airport around the country uh, because no one had thought about how to, you know, it's one thing not to figure out how to get the, prisoners out of Guantanamo, it's another thing to stop people from entering the country without having given 10 seconds worth of thought to how you're going to go about it, which really created chaos and I think created, frankly, judges thinking that, um, you know, that this just hadn't been very well thought through. So I don't know if anybody in the room, I didn't have a chance to listen to the, the Fourth Circuit or the Ninth Circuit arguments in the last week or so. I heard that the Acting Solicitor General Jeff Wall was quite good. Um, but he was arguing a particular issue, which I think is actually pretty relevant, which is a presumption of regularity. He was, his, his big argument seemed to be the president is entitled to a presumption of regularity. And you know, you could almost see the judges thinking to themselves, hmm, I wonder if that's right. Um, and a presumption of regularity is not an irrebuttable presumption of regularity, it's just a presumption of regularity. And, and I think if uh, the public, Congress, and the courts start thinking about whether the president is entitled to a presumption of regularity, I think that we're in not a place uh, anybody really wants to be. I mean, the other thing, obviously, is that the, the President Trump made a decision that he was going to be an outsider um, and, as a result, was quite hostile to the intelligence community, uh, said they were like Nazis, uh, complained about their abilities, um, said that... Um, uh, you know, 17 law enforcement agencies had decided Russia was involved in in uh, interfering with their election, and he decided, well, it could be some guy sitting in his uh, uh, mother's basement. He had and very strong opinions about that guy's weight, too. He's, yes, he was a fat guy. I don't know. I, uh, not being a techie, I really, maybe they're all fat. I don't have any idea, but uh, he's definitely a fat techie. Um, <laughs> and... Um, you know, after he made the comment about whether they're tapes or not, which was sort of on Director Comey, better not leak because there could be tapes, I thought to myself, I've known Jim Comey for a long time. I'm pretty sure he doesn't care whether they're tapes because I think he pretty much knows what was said in that conversation. And whether he was going to leak or not, he was pretty obviously going to be called at some point to testify. So whether it was going to be a leak or whether he was going to sit in front of Congress and tell him what happened in those conversations, that was all going to happen. And um, so I can't imagine that the FBI was very enamored of an attack on their uh, sort of their director. But the president has made a decision to be sort of uh, uh, challenging of the institutions of government as opposed to trying to bring them along in developing the policy issues that he wants. And, you know, some ways some of this is an inevitable outcome of having made that decision, I think. 
So I want to address briefly the Guantanamo uh, order, which I think is actually a really good thought experiment here. And, and I actually agree with Judge McKenzie uh, that this was an irresponsible thing for Barack Obama to have done. And I'm actually one of the very few people who wrote an in-depth analysis of it saying that the day it came down. Uh, and I, so I actually completely agree that it was, and by the way, there was a failure of process there too, which is uh, that uh, though there was a lot, a much better process led to that executive order than led to the uh, immigration, there was a process um, that took place over the course of the transition, but there was a deep failure of process and it's actually reflected in the text of the order itself, which is that rather than, uh, Rather, it announced an outcome uh, without saying, uh, without doing any of the analysis that would support that outcome. In other words, if you're going to, there were 240 plus people at Guantanamo at the time. If you're going to get rid of them at all, all you have to figure out what you're going to do with them, as, as Judge McKenzie said. And none of the analysis to do that had been done. And so what the executive order actually did was it created a process but then it announced the outcome at that process at the same time. And as a few people, including Jack Goldsmith and I, pointed out at the time, that outcome is actually extremely difficult to achieve. And so it's not obvious that the process that you're creating could support the outcome that you had announced. And that was the problem fundamentally with that executive order. I do think, however, that this is uh, that on steroids, right? Which it, it also had that uh, uh, that vice, which is you announce an outcome and then you set up a process in order to support that outcome. Uh, but it uh, had immediate consequences for tens and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, which was just not true of the of the Guantanamo order, and it also as became very fatefully obvious within a couple of days, uh, it had a lot of people who could challenge that. And one of the things about the Guantanamo order is that you know, there really is nobody who has standing to challenge it and no basis to litigate it since the uh, detentions in question were lawful and you were basically arguing that you were going to, dis as a discretionary matter, release a bunch of people or transfer a bunch of people who you in fact had the authority to hold. Uh, so I think as a, as a self-inflicted wound, and I, I really don't want to understate the Gitmo order as a self-inflicted wound because it dogged the Obama administration literally until the day he left office. So it was eight years of self-inflicted wound, but it's eight years of, of, of paper, of reopening the same paper cut. Whereas, whereas the immigration executive orders really was like a, a, a stab in one's own chest on day one. Um, so. I want to I want to turn to you mentioned the, the the Comey firing, and I'm interested in how this, in both of your judgments, fits in. On the one hand, we have I don't think anybody contests that the president has the authority to remove the FBI director. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you do have a very strong norm uh, embodied in a 10-year statute that the uh, FBI director does not go in or come out with an, with an administration. And so uh, my question is just how should we understand this act in relation to a discussion of the unitary executive? I Just for openness, I'm not at all sure that that 10-year term was necessarily um, minimum. Um, recall that a preceding um, FBI director named J. Edgar Hoover was there for decades. Um, and I think that the 10 years was really intended to be a maximum rather than a minimum. Um, I don't think there was any, anybody ever denied um, from the get-go that um, the president could fire the attorney general for cause, cause including losing the confidence of the country, losing the confidence of his own agency, at least for a time. And um, that said, um, I think the ideal time to have done that would have been on January 20th. So I, I mentioned in my opening statement how important I think norms are and how important I think filing, file, following norms is. 
I agree that the, that is actually as Director Comey said in a statement as he was leaving. I think actually probably after he left uh, was that the president had the power to uh, uh, fire him for any reason or for no reason. Um, not going to quite get into it, but at the time I heard that, I thought to myself, I'm not actually sure that that's true. Um, but um, the norm, I think, had become part of a really important norm that I spent an enormous amount of time policing when I was in the White House, which is that the White House stays out of criminal investigations full stop. Full stop. Never did it. Full stop. Never got involved. And... It came up even in sort of odd ways, which was obviously during the Obama administration, I assume they'll continue to happen. There were shootings of police officers and shootings by police officers. And in each of those occasions, the president was called upon to say something about each of those. And I would have him talk about the tragedy of the shooting, but he would not conclude whether the shooter was guilty of something. He would not, even, even Dylan Roof, he didn't condemn Dylan Roof and say he should be punished for anything. He, was empathetic to the families of the people who had been killed, but but he stayed out of ascribing guilt. And I think that that was part of, maybe a little overly conservative by me actually, but it was part of my view that the, the President of the United States, who is, essentially, who, is at, who is above the Attorney General uh, in, the, in the hierarchy, absolutely had to stay out of any criminal matter whatsoever. Except and, one. Can I, can I just push you on that? Because the president did very publicly overrule the attorney general on where Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and friends should be tried, right? So, um, so I predated me, so was not, I know as much about that probably as you do. Um, there was another involving a professor at Harvard who encountered the police and was the subject of a commentary by the, by the president. Gates, I guess. So on, yeah, they had the beer summit. I, um, yes, indeed. But I think that on that one, it was over where the prosecution should take place. It wasn't over whether he should be prosecuted. What we stayed away from, and that had enormous policy issues about New York and all that kind of stuff. But the issue of whether someone should be prosecuted, whether there should be an investigation, whether there should be an indictment, we just stayed out of it, um, and we had to stay out of it. And I think that's a critical norm. You know, I think if people think that that these decisions are made on the basis of anything other than merits by by career prosecutors, uh, then I think that our society is in a very uh, uh, difficult state and that we have to stay away from that. And so I was very guarded about it, and I think that that is a norm that has to be followed scrupulously. So I'm, I'm interested in, uh, and I don't want to assume any facts true, but let's, uh, let's you know, talk about the story last night uh, that uh, uh, in the New York Times that contends that uh, the president specifically and privately asked the FBI director to uh, go easy on General Flynn or sort of to drop the Flynn matter. And I'm just interested from both of you, is, is that a conversation that you could imagine taking place in the administrations that you served in? One word answer. No. And, and but, well, I'm interested, in Neil, in your answer as well. No. Ab no. So, so what about it, um, um, Judge McKay, what about it uh, gives rise to the unthinkability of it from in, in the Bush administration? Well, um, the president, I think, if there's anything to the theory of the unitary executive, has the power to direct that an investigation cease. But that, that wasn't, as the story is, is told, that's not what happened. Um, it's a kind of informal, hey, would you cut this guy some slack? He's a nice guy. Um, and that kind of conversation about a, an ongoing proceeding um, conducted in a manner that is extraordinarily informal and suggests a kind of um, lesser uh, degree of, of, of it was just complete unconsciousness of what it is that's, that's actually happening. Um, that, 
that that conversation may be appropriate uh, to a minor disciplinary matter in a in a in a, in a corporation. Um, it's not appropriate to a criminal investigation, and the inability to distinguish the one from the other, I think, is extraordinary. So, is in your in your view, uh, in the Bush administration, would there ever have been a circumstance in which I mean, the the, the account in 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 that story is that the Attorney General, i.e. you, not not you in the story, but, but the person in your role, and the FBI Director were with the President, the Attorney General is dismissed, and the President then has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a special pleading with the FBI Director. But my second question is, is there any circumstance in which the, uh, obviously, in which the president meeting with the attorney general and the FBI director, in which it's appropriate to dismiss the attorney general and deal directly with the FBI director on an investigative matter? No, because um, although <laughs> several FBI directors might challenge this, the FBI director reports to the attorney general, um, doesn't report directly to the president. I mean, there's a, there's a Although there was a great story, if I may digress for a moment, about, about Ramsey Clark. When he first became Attorney General, he showed up at the, at the <laughs> Justice Department one weekend um, in his trademark leather patch, elbow patch blazer. I was walking in the hall and was challenged by a guard who said, can I see your credentials? And he said, I, I'm the Attorney General. Let me see your credentials. He said, you, know, you don't understand. I am the Attorney General. The response was, I don't care if you're J. Edgar Hoover himself. I want to see the, I want to see your credentials. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> well, Neil, what are your thoughts on this? Are, do, 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 is there is there any circumstance in which the president should be meeting directly with the FBI director on on not through the Justice Department under under uh, about an investigative matter and how how strong, like what were the rules of that sort of contact when you were in office? Well, um, the um, it would not have happened when I was in office because we wouldn't be talking to the FBI director or really to the attorney general about a specific investigative matter. Everything in the White House is politicized. We are political. We are a, it's a political operation that is, um, that is, uh, you know, putting forth a political objective. It's a political operation. And our view was that if it came out of the White House, it would be politicized. It wouldn't be seen as the right outcome from the for the country. It would be seen as the right outcome for the White House. And uh, we those decisions couldn't be made on whether they're the right outcome for the White House. And so it's the danger of politicization and the notion that nobody's going to believe that it's anything other than because of some political purpose, because otherwise the White House is kind of not involved in these things. So we, we, would, not, we would not have discussions uh, uh, like that about the progress of an investigation. And, and you know, um, that's sort of a general investigation. Put aside an investigation of a very close associate of the president, that's, that would just not happen. Although we, we do have the example of um, the president under whom you serve, commenting publicly that um, he didn't think that Secretary Clinton had done anything that warranted the bringing of charges because she certainly didn't intend to violate the law and he didn't think there would be any charges brought. Um, a statement that I think was regarded in some quarters as the king's wish. He was yeah. talked to by the White House counsel after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good. I'll just pause a moment for the for the reporters in the room to finish typing. Um, <laughs> um, let's go to the audience. Uh, when you come to the mic for questions, the mic is in the back of the, the aisle. When you come to the mic for questions, please uh, give your name and direct, uh, please formulate your, your question in the form of a question and one that's preferably relatively brief and directed at one of the individuals here. Sir. I wish I could pick up one of you to direct this to, but I can't. Um, 
my name is Woody Kaplan. My, I'm older than most of you, so I, my first national presidential campaign was against the imperial presidency of Lyndon Baines Johnson. You see my prejudice. Um, I want to remind you that Republican Richard Darman was tasked by his boss, the Attorney General Richardson, another Republican, to when the FBI came to the Justice Department to find out what their file looked like on President Richard Nixon to confiscate that file. Um, the Attorney General tasked Darman to take the entire file down the fire escape in the back and keep it from the FBI. I think that separation is incredibly important. The unitary executive reminds me a little bit of why we had a revolution to begin with. And I'm wondering that your comfort in this, everything from Bush signing statements to Obama's um, executive orders isn't violative of the spirit at least, if not the law, and what America is about. Judge, do you want to take that? Or, I mean, I'm happy Gee, to if, if why, you don't. Why don't you start? Um, I, look, I, violative of the spirit is one of those things that's, um, that's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I should point out that Richard Darman was not the President of the United States. Um, yes, it's possible for there to be abuses under such a system. Um, I think it beats the Dickens out of any alternative. And besides, um, it is not the system that is provided for, um, that is an alternative to the unitary executive, it is not the system that is provided for in the only constitution we've got. And I suggest we not do any pioneering. Uh, unless it's by amendment, let's come up with a different system. Do you want to, do you want to add anything? No, I, I, th I think that's, uh, no, I don't really have anything to add to that. I, I will just say I agree with that 100% without caveat. I, I just want to add that, you know, there are a lot of uh, systems in the world uh, that have made different judgments about how unitary the executive should be than we have. And in fact, um, most most stably democratic countries do not have an executive as uh, unitary as ours. And the countries that have executives as unitary as ours have often not been stable, you know, remain stable democracies. And the American experience is extremely unusual, maybe singular, in having an executive this, uh, this vertically integrated uh, and uh, this unitary that remains a stable democracy. And so it's a, it's, there, there is a question there, it, and it's one on which we have defied history. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Gregory Dolan from University of Baltimore, and I think my question is probably mostly directed at Attorney General Mukasey. Um, and it goes to the story about the investigation of uh, then Vice President Cheney's Chief of Staff Scooter Libby. And I will preface it by saying that I only go, I was not on the inside, so maybe you'll correct me based on press reports that uh, Vice President Cheney was not happy with what was done to, perhaps correctly so, what was done to his uh, then chief of staff. And so I was wondering if, if in your view, the expression of Vice President's unhappiness, which I get from press reports take was expressed directly to the president, but also publicly, is any different than the president saying either again in the press or directly to the FBI director saying that so and so is a nice guy, maybe we shouldn't turn the screws on him. And if so, why is that different? Um, it's different because the person doing the expressing is the vice president, not the president. Um, and that in a unitary executive, I think, makes all the difference. Ma'am. 
Carolyn White. I'm with the Air Force General Counsel's Office, and I'd like to take it a little bit out of current events um, and talk about the fissures in the idea of unitary, because there are always disagreements between agencies. And frankly, normally, there's either informal mechanisms, negotiation, it gets hotter, you go up to the politicals, talk to each other. Then there's some formal ones of an interagency dispute with at least the two executive orders of going to OLC for a legal issue or OMB for other types and, and budgetary type issues. In my experience, that um, is not a very effective system at resolving disputes above a staff level and perhaps may be more ineffective currently in that a number of agencies and budget cuts are doing away with sort of their negotiation ADR type teams um, for one, and two, the issue that's already been identified of lacking a lot of politicals at the mid-level so that you're kind of having people talk to one another that don't have the perspective of a political appointee from the administration. So I'm asking both people, do you have any recommendations for more effective ways between agencies to really make it unitary? Um, so um, I don't really. I think you've identified the, the structures that exist, and I'm not sure what else there could be. I would say that um, if it had even a remote legal component, and I think it sometimes was just a hook, uh, it, it disputes between agencies would end up in front of me, frankly, and I would have, you know, usually cabinet level or deputy cabinet level people in my office explaining to me and arguing back and forth about what we ought to do, and I mediated some of those. So there, there are some less formal processes uh, out of the process that, that you identified. But it had to be a pretty significant level because I, I don't meet with, for the m a number of the same reasons, I don't meet with mid-level officials in the uh, Office of the Air Force General Counsel. That would not be appropriate for me to have that meeting. So, And it also, unless it were significant enough that either the Secretary of Defense or the Deputy Secretary of Defense or somebody at that level, the General Counsel, wanted to weigh in, it wouldn't be a, something sort of that would be at my level. I did a fair amount of that, but, it, but only with very senior people. Otherwise, I don't, you know, this is just the classic you know, State Department and DOD fight with each other all the time. It doesn't matter who the president is. They're going to, they regard their missions as somewhat different and they're going to fight. And yep. we just have to have a process to work it out. And and, uh, and I don't, the OMB process, I think we thought worked pretty effectively. We had pretty good OMB directors when uh, I was there. And I think that's, uh, ultimately, that's sort of the mechanism. But, but just because it's unitary, uh, doesn't mean it's going to be seamless, and uh, and so there's going to be some pushing and shoving, and just have to work through it. And my my experience was slightly different. Um, uh, there were disputes, and um, there was a there was a process. Um, they got to more and more senior people would do the negotiating um, until it either got got to the principals, uh, and if it continued after that. Um, then if it was a legal dispute, it could wind up at OLC. Um, if it was a policy dispute, um, it could wind up in the Oval. And I've participated in those. <laughs> so um, I don't recall White House counsel being involved in that process. It, I mean, it had to be a pretty big deal for it to end up in the Oval. So uh, he, it's, it's, it's a man with scarce time. So it. It was not every dispute between state and DOD didn't end up uh, before President Obama. No, not every dispute, but there, some of them wound up um, before the uh, the chief of staff, who was yeah. considered a sufficient surrogate for uh, the Oval. But I do think there's a, there's an interesting, uh, probably difference here between between President Bush and President Obama as as a personality matter uh, reflected in that. Right? I mean, you know. Uh, President Bush, you know, very much uh, saw himself as somebody who's, you know, the decisions get teed up, he makes decisions. He was, you know, famously called himself the decider. And Obama was was more of a, you know, a, of a deliberator, right? And he he was interested in 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 being a little bit more granular, which, you know, you know, people who admire it would call it cerebral and you know, sort of policy oriented, and people don't admire it would call it micromanaging. Um, but you know, you you can frame it as a positive or a negative. But I think what you're seeing in these two descriptions is is two very different personalities. And when you have a when you have a unitary executive, the functions and structures and 
process of the executive comes to resemble the individual at the top of it. Yeah, I mean, I can, and President Bush was enormously effective at it. I can remember one meeting um, in the Situation Room where five people, pretty heavy folks, I'm excluding myself, uh, were there, they thought, uh, to ratify a decision on which they all agreed, but nonetheless was important enough to require their presence. Um, about two minutes into the conversation, the president asked three questions, and the result changed 180 degrees. Ma'am. Thank you. Um, Janice Walt Grenadier, um, I want to go backwards a little bit to our friend Comey here. And um, the appearance of justice is just as important as justice itself. And the trust and common sense has left Washington. And Trump was put into place by the people because so many people do feel that way. And there isn't enough conversation about what's going on. And it's, it seems amazing to me, everybody seems to have forgotten that Lynch, Loretta Lynch and um, Comey started out together in New York City. Comey then came to Richmond and became an adjunct professor with Tim Kaine. I mean, the connections between all of our politicians as friends outside of their jobs, protecting each other's backs, is why Trump got, he, he got elected to fire Comey to take make sure that the American people knew McCab took $675,000 through his wife and is, didn't report Is there a question here? Yeah, I would like to ask um, Mr. Eggleston how he can defend something like that, how he can sit there, how he would defend the fact that Comey came out after Loretta Lynch and Bill Clinton sat in the plane how he can defend that McKay made the decision on the emails after his wife got $675,000 for election bid. So I was in the White House when all that happened, and we were uninvolved in all of that. And so I don't, <laughs> I don't have a, that, that, that was political. We were not involved in it. But let me go back to the, the, the uh, and I, nor have I defended it or addressed any of that since I've been sitting up here. So you're not asking me a follow-up question from something I've already said. But let me just say, go back to the first thing that you said, which is, uh, I think I opened and closed with the importance of trust. And I, uh, I agree with you, I, uh, um, I'm not making a political observation, I'm a lawyer, not a politician. But I agree with you on the importance of trust and how ephemeral trust is and how easy it is to lose and once lost, how difficult it is to regain. Once there's the motif of not trustworthy, can't be relied on, when they say something you don't know whether it's true or not true, that, that, is, a, that is a squandered resource that um, no administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Bush administration, the tr I, I think that the trust is the, is the most important coin of the realm. And, um, and, uh, and I completely agree with you that I, start, well, I started my opening remarks on that and I finished my opening remarks on that and I'm in complete agreement with you about the importance of maintaining that trust with the other two branches of government and with the American people. I agree with you on that. Thank you. Sir? Uh, Zach Hardin, uh, Berkeley Law School. I was wondering if you can explain how the uh, Iranian executive agreement in the utilitarian um, executive, um, your remarks on the combination of those two. Attorney General McKenzie, you wanted to talk about that earlier, so here's a great opportunity to do so. Yeah, I mean, look, um, I never heard any explanation um, of why that wasn't treated as a treaty um, other than the Secretary of State's statement that it's real hard to get a treaty um, <laughs> through the Senate, to which the only possible response is, duh. <laughs> um, yes, and um, there's that. And it was also, by the way, I, I have to tip my hat to the administration. It was a masterpiece of political jujitsu because what happened was you start out with an agreement that should have required two-thirds approval of the Senate and you wound up with a disapproval resolution being vetoed 
by the president such that you needed two-thirds of both houses in order to override it. To do that, um, and to have that, to allow, to have allowed that to be done, um, I thought required extraordinary skill on one side and extraordinary lapse on the other. But can I, can, can I follow up with you on that? I, this is a matter of which I don't have uh, either strong views or a strong background. Um, but it seems to me I mean, I have a strong background, but obviously I have strong views. <laughs> Uh, but is this an issue of the unitary executive, or is this an issue of the substance of, the, uh, of executive authority relative to the treaty power? Well, yes to both, I think. Um, so, it, so, so just connect it for me to the question of sort of how unitary or, or, or how unitary the executive authority is. This seems to me to be a question of whether whether the ability to make executive agreements outside the treaty power is is or isn't encompassed within the executive power at all. I'm sure it's encompassed within it. The question is, where does it end? Um, and I think it ends well short of of that. Okay. I mean, yes, there were executive there were executive agreements for relatively trivial matters. You don't make everything a, between countries a treaty. Um, on the other hand, um, this wasn't trivial. So Neil, do you, do you want to speak up on behalf of the, uh, h how do you square the Iran agreement with the uh, relatively restrained view of substantive executive authority that you described earlier that the uh, Obama administration took? Well, um, so obviously this issue of whether it was a treaty came through my office because uh, it's a kind of a legal issue. We concluded, and I've, frankly I'm not dodging this, I just don't, re I don't remember the analysis, but we concluded that it was on the executive agreement side of the line and not on the treaty side of the line. It is also true that near the, not the beginning of the process, but as the process was under consideration, Congress passed a framework for how it would consider uh, the uh, matter and came up with the framework that uh, Judge Mukasey identified, which seemed to us to be a recognition that it was a, not a treaty but an executive agreement, and that's the the way the process was followed. And at the end, and the process that Judge Mukasey described was the process that was passed by Congress when it uh, considered how to deal with the issue. And so, um, uh, so anyway, that's where that's where we ended up on that. I thought it was on the executive uh, agreement side of the line, not the treaty side of the line, and I thought that the way the uh, Congress handled it, it essentially agreed with my analysis. Sir, uh, Dove Colton from New York. Um, the question is for Mr. Eggleston, going back to the uh, investigation of Hillary Cl of Secretary Clinton's email server. Uh, were there any unique protocols put in place by by your office? about how the White House should discuss or not discuss um, the investigation because of the political sensitivity of it? And is there any protocol that might have been put in place that would be good guidance for the Trump administration as they move forward in politically sensitive uh, investigations? So, um, you know, as uh, Mike has pointed out, it wasn't 100% successful, um, but, uh, Generally, on these kinds of investigations, we took the position that we weren't going to discuss them. So Josh Ernest would get the question from time to time, um, but would typically punt it over to the Justice Department. And again, I think our view, for a lot of reasons, was that it, it, it was an inch issue that was being handled independently. It was not a political issue uh, and was being handled independent of the White House, and only mischief would come from a suggestion that we were involved in it. And so I did everything I could to uh, make it clear that we just were not in, we were not involved in it. And look, you know, people get in situations and they say things from time to time. But but um, it was important to me that the issue not seem to be politicized within the White House. And so I uh, made that clear. It was consistent with the the policy we already had in place, which is that we wouldn't comment or get involved in individual criminal prosecutions, individual matters. So it was a reaffirmation, a reminder of people what the policy was. And I think it's a very good but policy. But nothing, nothing unique to this? No, to no, no. I probably talked about it more, 
uh, and reaffirmed it in the specific context of the Clinton investigation because obviously it was in the paper all the time. But I, there, was, there wasn't anything unique that, uh, that I remember that we particularly did. I think it's a good policy and I think it's a policy that this administration, the Trump administration should adopt. And I've now said it a couple of times, but I just think there's an enormous danger in people thinking that uh, criminal prosecutions, which could result in people being put in jail or people who should be in jail not being in jail, be decided other than on the pure merits of the situation and not on anything else. And so that's, we, we really thought that was an important norm that had to be followed. And and I had a complete agreement on it um, among people in the White House. Although, again, there were instances when, for example, people were released from prison after conviction, uh, sometimes before conviction, um, in aid of policies that the White House was pursuing. Well, but I think, Mike, that's completely unfair. I think you're talking about exercise of its clemency power. That's a constitutional power, and I have no apology that's... for the President of the United States using his constitutional power, and I think that's not analogous to... Uh, that's fair. I think it's different. That's fair. So, but Neil, let me, let me push you on another aspect of that point, as I think it's just going to be of broad public interest today. It's, um, it's, a, it's very easy to say we don't consult with the FBI or the Justice Department on investigative matters. We don't talk about it if you're the White House. When there aren't decisions being made that you have especially strong views of, and let's assume for entirely non-corrupt or inappropriate reasons, but, you know, or that the law enforcement components in question aren't doing things that the president is tearing his hair out over uh, or that people in the White House are. And so my question is, is was there ever a situation, and I'm not asking you to reveal any inappropriate confidences or anything, but was there ever a situation in which the White House really wanted to pick up the phone and say to the FBI or say to the Justice Department, hey, what's going on on this investigative matter and you didn't do it because of this norm? Or is this a situation where, you know, you observed a certain norm, but it's easy to observe a certain norm because you were basically comfortable with everything the Justice Department and the FBI were doing? So, as in, are you giving yourself too much credit for yeah. what was easy? No, I get, I get that. I think the, I think the flaw in your, in your question, though, is we never, since we made the decision we weren't going to do it, we never analyzed, is this one we really want to do, but we're not doing it because Eccleston told us we can't. It, we, everybody knew we weren't going to do it, so it didn't, it didn't get teed up uh, it really in the same fashion. Um, so I don't, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe it was easy to follow the follow it, but we, you know, as, as has come up before, we put these policies in place before the hard case before a hard case came up, so that we would follow them if a hard case came up. So, um, so we had the policy and followed it, and never then sort of thought, well, is this? Do we care so much about this one that this should be an exception? So let me turn the question around from your point of view as Attorney General. Um, was there ever a time that you had to throw a brush back pitch at the White House and say, that's an inappropriate question, you shouldn't be asking me or my people that question? Or was there ever a time when you felt you had to defend a line of no questions about live investigative matters? Um, or was the norm simply observed? The norm was observed. There were, there were, there were issues relating to positions in litigation. Um, but but that's, that's legitimate, right? That's legitimate. And um, there, are, there are sometimes issues relating to resource allocation, but that's a much higher right. level of abstraction than a particular case. But there was never a time when you were Attorney General where an official at the White House or the President himself uh, asked a question or made an inquiry or uh, intimated a preference as to the direction of a particular investigation that you thought was inappropriate. Correct. Sir. Uh, I'm Chris Bowen. Um, this question is for uh, the Honorable Mukasey. Um, Formerly there, Honorable, actually. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of any administration, there are a certain number of political appointees who then transform themselves into uh, the career service. Right, a, um, a process known as burrowing in. Right. Does this 
have you found that this poses a problem, especially uh, to the idea of a unitary executive? Sure, um, and it poses a particular political problem, if I may say so, under a Democratic administration rather than a Republican administration, because Republicans tend to be the sorts of people who, you know, go out and make money after they serve in the government, and Democrats, being principally a party of government, want to make a career out of it, and so they are more inclined, I think, perhaps to go from uh, political positions to career positions, It's and it's something to be concerned about. Um, Although I can recall getting a question from um, a Democratic senator um, wanting statistics on after the election on the number of um, Republican political appointees who were asking to convert their service to career service, um, and the number was distressingly small. Sir. My name is Roman Martinez. I was a uh, civil servant at the Justice Department during the uh, last administration. I'm now in private practice. I have a question for Mr. Eggleston. Uh, thank, first of all, thank you very much for coming here uh, into the lion's den, uh, so to speak. But uh, since you're here, uh, I was wondering if you could respond to one of the critiques that's out there about the Obama administration's use of executive power. It seems like in a number of different areas, there were circumstances in which the president uh, was public about the fact that he didn't have a certain power uh, he tried to advance his policy objectives uh, going through Congress or through other means. Congress essentially said no, and then the administration went ahead and, and did it anyway. The, the examples that come to mind are uh, recess appointments, uh, the sort of de facto amnesty with respect to DAPA, uh, millions of, of people who are in the country illegally, uh, arguably climate change and, and sort of uh, cap and trade and then also the use of military force, uh, most notably in Libya, where the administration took the position that dropping uh, thousands of tons of bombs on, on Libya was uh, not hostilities under the War Powers Act. Um, so I wonder, if stepping back from those examples, it seems like uh, it might be reasonable to say that, or to wonder whether instead of faithfully executing the law, the administration in, in those instances and maybe others was uh, sort of coming up with after the fact legal justifications for actions that it, it knew, or at least the president knew, were not lawful. I just wonder if you could respond to that critique. No, I think that's a good question. It's a criticism that obviously we've heard from time to time. Let me just tell you about the one I know most about. Uh, I wasn't around for Libya. I know there's a lengthy OLC opinion that, uh, that uh, supported the president's decision in connection with Libya. And as you all know, OLC is largely career people. It's only got a couple of political people at the top. Um, the one I know most about is DAPA. I think that's been misconstrued, actually. Um, I think what he what he said is that he couldn't, that he, in order to get the bill passed that he was pushing, that he would need Congress. But I don't think that he said he couldn't do anything in the uh, this area without the help of Congress. And uh, and so I, I think you, you have to pay attention. I don't I don't think he said he couldn't do anything. And ultimately. Um, we had significant support, as I say, including an OLC opinion in support of what we did, that uh, that was lawful. So I, you know, um, uh, I don't think the rap, I think that you can be critical of him, although I think the criticism is unfair, for engaging in a number of, uh, the, uh, of actions that ultimately were suspended by courts, but, but I don't think flip-flopping is a particularly salient attack on this, actually. We have time for one more question. Josh? Hey, Josh Gerstein with Politico. Um, I wanted to ask you about some comments that the White House uh, spokespeople have made in the last week or so. On two different occasions, two different spokespeople from the White House podium said that it was their view or the administration's view that there did not need to be a special counsel to investigate the uh, Russia interference, alleged Russian interference in the 2016 election. Um, what's your view on whether making those sorts of statements public is uh, publicly is appropriate or wise for the White House, and do you think there's any chance that, given the rules the Justice Department uses in those situations, that making that kind of a public suggestion might be counterproductive? Um, what the White House should or shouldn't say, it seems to me, is up to the White House um, as to whether there's a need for a special prosecutor. I've expressed myself on this before. There was, a, as far as I know, the only crime that anybody's pointed to in connection with the pending investigation was the hacking, which was complete when the 
Russians did it. Um, there is no, if you look in Title 18, you will find no crime um, identified as collusion. Um, there is a crime called conspiracy. That requires an agreement to do something to bring about the result. If the result was the hacking and the distribution of the information, that was complete before any collusion, if there was any, took place. So the notion that you need a special prosecutor to get into that, I think, is, is remote. I'm also not a fan, generally, um, of special prosecutors for a wide variety of reasons, including the fact that, number one, they make work for themselves um, and feel the need to produce results generally in the form of an indictment. Um, and secondly, that um, we have this wonderful political system that was designed by probably the, the, the greatest assemblage of political geniuses ever in one place. Um, and yet you find persistent calls to go outside it and appoint somebody special. Um, first of all, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a chimera. I mean, that you, you, can't, you can't have um, somebody who's independent of the executive. Prosecution is inherently an executive function. And we don't, in times of crisis, sprout a new branch of government that's independent of the others. Um, so it's an illusion. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, I don't, the pronouncements from the White House about whether you should or shouldn't appoint a special prosecutor don't particularly stir me one way or the other. Final thoughts, Neil? So Josh, I don't, I mean, I don't have anything to say in addition to what I've said on the general subject, which is we wouldn't have commented about whether there should be an investigation, who should conduct the investigation, uh, you know, with with the, uh, the Mukasey uh, uh, issue pointing out to me, we, we would have stayed away generally from this. And so this White House and this president has obviously made a different decision, um, uh, including in tweets uh, about those kinds of things. But that's, you know, they've made a different uh, judgment than we made about whether we should be involved in these kinds of matters. And, you know, they're, that's a norm that, they've decided not to follow, which is a fine, which is a decision that they're entitled to make. It's not, it's not a constitutional issue. Uh, we made a different judgment about those. I would just like to say in closing uh, that it is a remarkable thing that we just had a panel on the unitary executive and we got to the last question before the term special prosecutor or independent counsel was said. Uh, and that's actually a reflection of changed law and uh, 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 over time. Um, uh, with that, thank, please join me in thanking our, our, our panelists. <laughs>